Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation as part of the Industry Insight webinar series. The topic this time is client development for law firm growth. Speaking today will be Joshua Lennon. Joshua is an attorney admitted to the New York Bar. He studied law at St. Louis University School of Law, obtaining a Juris Doctorate and a Certificate in International and Comparative Law. During this time, Joshua clerked for the Missouri Attorney General, helping prosecute discrimination claims on behalf of Missouri citizens. He also studied European Union Law at the University of Georgia School of Law's Brussels Legal Seminar. When working for Thomson Reuters' his publishing departments in both the United States and Canada, he helped legal practitioners improve their services. Joshua currently serves as a lawyer in residence for Clio, providing legal scholarship and research skills to the leading cloud-based practice management platform headquartered in Vancouver, Canada. He's been a guest lecturer for movements like legal hacking and legal technology at schools like MIT, Suffolk Law, and Vanderbilt. He's also spoken before organizations like reInvent Law and the ABA Law Practice Futures Initiative. The presentation today will be followed by a Q&A. Please enter your questions into the question box on the webinar panel on the right side of your screen. All questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We're recording this webinar and we'll be sending a video and a follow-up email in a few days. We'll also post a video on our blog over at lawtechnologytoday.org. Thank you all for joining us. We'll now begin the webinar. Hello. Thanks, Austin. I appreciate you giving that introduction. I want to invite everybody to client development for law firm growth. I want to take a look at technology for marketing and client management. And as Austin said, I'm Joshua Lennon. I'm the lawyer in residence at Clio. I'm an attorney admitted into New York, and you can always reach out to me via uh, social media at, at Joshua Lennon on Twitter. Today, I want to cover a couple of key points. I want to take a look at a state of confusion that exists amongst clients and potential clients. I want to take a look at what Big Law does to overcome that confusion and how we might be able to learn from that. I want to take a look at some business development ground rules um, that lead into client development. And then I want to talk about how tech can even your odds. And then lastly, of course, we'll take questions. Let's jump right in. I think a state of confusion exists amongst potential clients and how to hire a lawyer. And that confusion was actually backed up by a recent report that came out in November of 2017 from the Legal Services Consumer Panel. Now, they're a neutral third party in the United Kingdom that takes a look at legal services and access to legal services by the public. And in their Market Transparency and Legal Services report that came out in November, they found a startling fact. They say 24% of clients do not have a wide range of choice when choosing a law firm and that this stat, this stat, as low as it is, was actually a drop from the previous year, where in 2016, 28% of clients said they do not have a wide range. And if you're like me, uh, and you pay attention to any type of advertising at all, you know that lawyers advertise all the time. I see their ads on Google, I see their ads on TV, I see their ads on billboards. So how can it be that a potential client thinks there's not a law firm out there for them? This report went on to delve into a little bit more about what these clients are looking for. For example, only 27% of potential clients reach out to more than one law firm. And what they're looking for when they reach out to these law firms is some very specific information. They're looking for prices. And only 6% of consumers say that they can find price information on a law firm website. And so while they may be attempting to find more than one law firm, they pretty much go with the one who gives them pricing information and responds to them quickly and upfront. Um, and even that may not necessarily be enough. We know that the ease of finding a lawyer varies by population. For example, in the study by the Legal Services Consumer Panel, they found that 72% of Caucasian British consumers report that it was easy to find information on the regulation of lawyers compared to 59% of minority English uh, English residents. And so depending on the population that your law firm is serving, you may find that you're not as easy to hire as you think you are. Now, big law definitely knows that this is a problem, but they've also figured out a way to overcome it. For example, we know, according to the BTI Market Outlook and Client Service Review, that big law is the only segment that's really growing their market share. And so they're growing their market share at 60% compared to 20 to 30% for smaller law firms. And this report looks at what they're doing and why they're doing it. And the one thing that they are doing that you are not is they are spending time and money on client development. 
And so while this stat that we have circled here, 34% for client development, whereas 26% for the rest of, of smaller law firms, seems like a big disparity. There's another stat on this chart that I think is really important that, that we should pay attention to as well. And that's they're spending salaries. They're throwing not just time but money and people at the problem. And why are they able to devote time, people, and money to the idea of client development? It's because they know it pays dividends. So in that same BTI market report, if we take a look at marketing strategies and how important they are from left to right, and marketing strategies and how they drive revenue from top to bottom, this upper right quadrant here is where both time and money come together to create revenue for law firms. And what's very interesting to me is we see here that four out of the five items within this quadrant are all related to how you handle your clients. So are you, get, are you open to client feedback? Are you being receptive in client communications? Are you giving your clients the ability to recommend you? And are you working with clients on reaching out on their legal needs prior to them happening or giving them a strategy once they do happen? If you focus on these, those will drive revenue at your law firm. And yet a lot of law, uh, lawyers actually tend to think about business development as the activities that we see in the rest of this chart. Networking events, webinars, like the one we're attending right now, your firm website. And while they're all important, and while they can all drive revenue, it's these uh, five items, with four of them being client focus, that are the most important and drive the most revenue. And how much revenue do they drive for law firms? Well, according to BTI, it can actually be up to 200% greater fees from a single client. But pretty much across all of the metrics important to law firm growth, that better client feedback and superior client service actually helps you. 33% higher profits, a nearly 20% rate premium across all of your staff, 33% higher client retention, and 35% higher growth, mostly due to, refer to referrals. And to back up this study, I did some further research, taking a look at a, a similar study published by McKenzie. And what they found was that their research indicates that for every 10 percentage point uptick in customer satisfaction, a company can increase their revenues from two to three percent. So what that means is you need to know how happy your clients are, you need to be driving their satisfaction, and if you do so, you will see an increase in revenue. The McKinsey study went so far as to say is the top 25 percent of institutions that had high customer satisfaction scores actually had revenues that exceeded the bottom 25% by up to 40 percentage points. It's like giving yourself a 40% raise by focusing on client development as business development. But before you can do that, there are some ground rules that you need to know. So let's jump through those really quickly. There's only one thing more expensive than hiring a lawyer and that's advertising is one. So if you're going to advertise, expect that getting clients in the door is gonna be actually really difficult for you and very expensive. We know that the top 100 Google keywords in advertising um, are 78% legal and, well, 12% the rest. And did I just do the math right? No, 22% the rest. I apologize. Uh, and so, and I happen to think that the rest of the top 100 most expensive keywords actually are mostly related to legal issues as well. So water damage, insurance, drugs and alcohol, uh, those are pretty much legal issues. And if you break down what those costs are, um, the most expensive in this study was San Antonio car wreck attorney. So if somebody types in that phrase into Google, an ad shows up and whoever owns that ad is paying $670 per click to anyone who clicks on that ad, whether or not they become a client. And so, knowing the expense of that is actually really difficult. And once you get somebody to click on that and become a client, you need to get the maximum amount of business utility out of them, as well as be a good lawyer to them. So how much you, should you be spending in order to get a client? Most 
uh, experts, including Ed Pohl, the consultant and owner of lawbiz.com, recommend two to 5% of your annual revenue. Now this is actually really low compared to most other businesses. Most other businesses will spend around 10 to 11% of revenues on marketing and advertising. For law firms, two to five is kind of a rule of thumb, but know that it actually may have to vary based on your geography, your firm size, your practice area. Um, we know, for example, that higher growth contingency-based firms will spend in excess of 10% of their billings on marketing and business development just to get clients in the door. And once you have them in the door, then you'll need to be able to get a return off of them. Now, do you know if you're getting a return? Most of you do not. According to the law firms in business development transition report, 46% um, of lawyers don't know how much of their revenue is spent on business development and they don't know how effective it is. Uh, and what's interesting is we do know there are certain places where clients go to look for you. For example, we know that 80% of buyers of professional legal service are professional services, not just legal services. Go to your website to evaluate your capabilities regardless of how they hear about you. And one of the things they're going to be looking for as a part of that are things like, do you blog? Do you have a, a well-formatted LinkedIn profile? Do you have an effective website? Can they get e-alerts? Are there online rankings and ratings directories for you? And if you don't have all of these, then all the money you're spending on business development may potentially just be going down the drain. So what you need to do as part of business development is make sure that you set a budget and that you spend all that you allocate. You have to spend money to make money. Factor in time as well as money, and we know from research being done at Clio, that most lawyers are spending around 33% of their non-billable hours on business development. And so that's a cost to you. So if you need to figure that out, you need to add that in. And then lastly, you need to evaluate your return on investment, that's ROI. Now there are tools that'll help you with this. One of these is Clio's own campaign tracker tool that will allow you to set up campaigns, track leads and optimize your spending. And you can see a dashboard like this. But in addition to tools, Clio has been doing research on your behalf to see what works when it comes to finding, attracting and retaining clients. And just recently we did a survey of over 2000 consumers of legal services. We reached out to a third party uh, survey company. They were able to track down over 2000 people who have used lawyers in the past. And they asked them some questions about how they found lawyers and what criteria do they use in choosing a lawyer. Let me show you some of the results from this study. We found that most consumers find a lawyer from a referral by a family or friend. So the second is they use an online search engine. So if you're a San Antonio car wreck attorney, what's more, more cost effective for you in terms of getting a client? Is it spending $670 per click on a Google ad, or is it building a good referral network of friends and family? I think we can do the math and see that it's twice as effective to build that referral network. Interestingly, we see in that same study that referrals from another lawyer are the third most common and that they look at lawyer directories or listings like Avo or Yelp for other things. So that's 28%. So you can actually maximize your reach into the community by building this referral network and participating in online listings and ratings directories and actually save money compared to using an online search engine. But that's not enough. You, once you get somebody to know that you are a lawyer and that you are available for business, then consumers look for certain things when they try to hire a law firm. And if you remember the legal consumers panel that we talked about before, there's confusion on what lawyers offer and how you hire a lawyer. So when we ask consumers, how do you choose a lawyer once you found one, the most important thing they said was that they respond right away. The next two issues were related to obtaining legal information and pricing information, right? So free consults or fixed fees. And then there are other uh, equally important but lesser utilized metrics on ease of use and ease of communication with the lawyer and the ability to actually service themselves via a great looking website. 
So if you're gonna spend time and money on business development, and you should, you need to make sure that you're doing so in such a way that you're actually developing your client potential as such that they are happy with your services, that they will refer your services, and that they will build that law firm growth that you're seeking. So how do you do that? While in big law, they're leveraging people and salaries to make that happen. I don't think that's necessarily an opportunity for smaller law firms. And so I think you need to look at evening the odds. And that's where technology comes in. So technology is important because once you realize that every client interaction is a marketing moment for your law firm, it's a client development moment for your law firm, then you can start structuring your technology to enhance each of those moments. So if you think of when you interact with your clients, there are a couple of key moments. Clients are interacting with your website from the very beginning. They're gonna to go to your website. We know that 80% of them will go to your website before they even pick up the phone to call you. But they're also gonna take a look at third-party services and your social media. And so you should consider those as a part of your online presence. Your next interaction will be client intake. You'll have multiple interactions with them where you should be updating them on the status of their case or on the status of items that relate to their particular interests. You're also going to be dealing with them when they interrupt you, and that happens incredibly frequently. Uh, you'll be interacting with them via billing. Most people don't think of that as an interaction or a marketing moment, but it's a, one of the most important points where you can actually convey information to your client. And then lastly, you should be soliciting feedback from them. Remember, law firms, according to BTI, that solicit and act upon feedback receive up to 200% more fees per client. So let's go through each of these and take a look at where technology can really help you out. So most lawyers, interestingly, put up information on their website which isn't really of interest to clients. And so Matt Homan, who is an advisor at the nonbillablehour.com and does a lot of facilitations in the legal community, uh, came up with this great chart on what lawyers put on their website, what clients look for, and where they overlap. And quite frankly, there's not a lot of overlap. Um, but it's interesting to note that Matt actually points out, will you return my calls as one of the highest priority issues for clients? Way back in 2013, he knew instinctively that this is what clients are looking for. And it's what our research has shown is the most important thing. So how do you go about creating a website that meets both your client's expectations and drives forth client development? Well, I wanna take a look at an example from Jennifer Reynolds, the lawyer at Fresh Legal. Uh, she is a Clio customer. She's given us permission to, to highlight some of the great work that she has done and her website. And I wanna show some of those examples for you. So in her website, she has what she calls the defined client experience. So clients can come and inform themselves on issues that are important to them with downloadable guides, the ability to sign up for a newsletter. She has a blog that she posts to on a regular basis, not a frequent basis, but a regular basis. And she has links to her social media accounts. Now she also makes it accessible to clients, all right? So there's contact information on every page. There's actions for clients to take. There's even a map on how to get a hold of her. Now actions are really simple. There are buttons like these. I want to become a client or to access the client portal. And we'll talk about client portals in just a little bit. She allows potential clients to educate themselves. So here they can sign up to download a free guide on her particular area of law, which is family law. And it actually allows her to create an automated MailChimp campaign that will email certain information to the clients on a regular basis. So this is a great instance of the technology behind the website creating client development on her behalf. So it also allows her to grab particular information about the clients. So what is their name? How can they help? How did they hear about uh, her law firm? And where were, are, were you referred by a particular lawyer? So she's starting to make sure that her network is working for her. And it basically syncs via email and Google spreadsheet to the firm automatically. 
and it creates new contacts in her MailChimp email campaign and in Clio so that she, once the client enters this information once, they don't have to re-enter it again the, for their initial client consult, for example. So it actually saves the client time, it informs the lawyer via technology, and it leads to a better experience. If you think about it, how many times have we called into, say, a business that we're doing work with, they ask us to enter our information, like say our phone number, through the touchpad, then we finally get a person, and they ask us to enter that information all over again. It's ridiculous. And Jennifer is actually noticing that that's ridiculous and frustrating for clients, and so she's making it easy for them to share that information and for her to seem prepared on their behalf. You can even book a consultation, and there are great um, information that she can pull from this, and it can even be linked to her calendar so that we can see available times and clients can kind of pick a time that's convenient to themselves. Now, how do you do this? Well, there are some great tools out there that do this for you. For example, there are two companies. Here's one, uh, Lawlytics and Juris Page by Uptime Legal, both of whom will help you build these types of websites with client-facing services like newsletters, like client portals, like the ability to sync information into your practice management system. And there are legal specific blogging services like Lexblog that will help you have up-to-date content in a way that is important and informative towards potential clients. And so once you get a client to your website and you have that effective website, then it's a great time to start a communication chain with them. And I think that's where client intake comes in. We know that client intake is especially important in terms of driving the experience as positive from the very beginning. There is a, an unfortunate lawyer um, who was reviewed on Avo who I think we can see set a bad experience with their clients because right off the bat, had a hard time getting a hold of a, the attorney. He never got back to me on issues. If a client reaches out to you, studies have shown that the amount of time between the initial contact and your ability to convince them to become a client diminishes with every hour. So a tool like Lexicata, which uh, you can see right here, is a great tool that enables you to track sources like referrals, social media, website, ratings directories, uh, give yourself an agenda on how to follow up these people, and even run some automated campaigns against them, and then once you're done, export all of that intake information to your practice management system. So it gives a very seamless, again, experience of collecting information and interacting with your potential client even before you actually are available to work for them. Uh, Lexicata can actually guide a client all the way up to signing a retainer agreement. So it makes it easy for have back and forth communication. It makes you seem available 24 seven, even though you're not, and enables you to help manage your communication expectations. So make sure you're communicating to your client when and where you're available and how to contact you, how soon to expect a response, and how to send you information when you're not available. And I think there are some really interesting tools that will help you with this that can even be practice area specific. For example, if you're an IP lawyer, there are tools like Tracklight or Alt Legal that actually create interactive portals with your clients to gather the specific information related to their trademark or their patent dispute. There are tools like Prima Fasci or Borderwise for immigration that do the exact same back and forth. Let's gather the information necessary to move your case forward. And once you have a good, strong communication channel and a lot of information passed back and forth with your clients, then you can start using technology to provide them updates. For example, we saw that communicating by text message was actually really important to some clients. And so there are tools like ZipWhip, which will allow you to send automated reminders to your clients, like we have an appointment coming up, or there's a deadline and I need you to meet it. Now, I, I am a bit skeptical on sharing too much information over text messages, so make sure that you're programming it so you're not necessarily posting confidential information, but are instead uh, giving the appropriate type of reminders that clients need to advance their cases forward. So don't say, the settlement came through, will you agree to settle for you know, a million dollars? 
but instead uh, you've got a new message from your attorney, please log into the client portal to see what this information is. And other types of app dates can use like AppToto, which will have calendar-based reminders that can be sent to clients. But maybe you have um, clients who aren't necessarily in active matters. That's where I think you need to turn to newsletters and there are services like MailChimp, which is used by Jennifer Reynolds, uh, and Constant Contact, which is one of the most popular newsletter programs out there that will run a lot of these newsletters almost automatically for you. And in fact, the favorite tool that I am using right now is a tool called eLink. And what it does, is it allows me to add articles with the click of a mouse from my web browser. So if I'm reading a really interesting article that I think is appropriate for a newsletter that I'll send to clients, I click a little button in my browser, it actually saves the article as a link and grabs, say, the image and the headline and creates a professionally formatted newsletter for me that goes out on a regular basis via email. So the type of reading that I'm doing on behalf of my client anyway, industry updates, new and emerging case law, things that I might wanna communicate to a client as a potential reason to hire me again for a new matter, I can actually do this as part of my normal reading and have a newsletter that goes out with no extra effort than a click, and I like to review it before I send it real quick. Done. Clients also will want updates on their ongoing matters, and so that's where you need to have access to a client portal. Now, any um, modern practice management system will have client portals available to you. You can see these allow clients to see all sorts of upcoming information, like their calendar, tasks that you have signed for them, documents that they can upload, bills and other communications that you have with them. Um, what's really interesting is, I think you can start combining all of these tools together. In fact, all of these tools that I have shown you actually can be linked together to create a seamless experience with the client. And they can even come together to help when clients try to interrupt you. So tools like a virtual receptionist, like Ruby receptionist, can actually answer the phone. And if they plug into tools like your practice management system, and Ruby does with tools like Clio, for example, they can take a look at your calendar. They can say when you're available. They can schedule appointments with the client for you. They can take notes and add them to the matter. So that way when you call the client back, you're informed about the issue and can be prepared for the conversation. By seamlessly tying all of this together, even interruptions don't necessarily interrupt your workflow. And we know that the average attorney is dealing with three to 10 interruptions every day from clients. So if you're trying to get work done on their behalf, sometimes you can't always be on the phone with them. So this is a great way to balance the two. And once you get that work done, use a seamless online system like Clio Payments or LawPay, um, which powers Clio Payments, to make sure that you can share the bill online, allow them to choose when to pay it by clicking the link in their email. They can enter the information, confirm the payment, and receive their own receipt without them having to write a check, get a stamp, mail it to you, wait for you to deposit, wait for the check to clear, wait for you to send them a receipt. What type of client experience is that? It's just not. And if you create this seamless experience, then you're gonna be ready for feedback. And the tool that I recommend for that right now is a tool called Delighted. Um, what it does is it enables you to send a very simple question to your clients. Would you refer my service to another interested party? And that's actually a question that's called the net promoter score. And companies are measuring this on an, on an incredibly frequent basis. Clio measures this. And if you ask this question, you'll get a sense of, do your clients like your service? Are they open to referring you to other potential clients? And you can then start asking for those referrals. And if they aren't happy with you, you can start soliciting feedback on how you can improve and get a higher net promoter score. By doing this automatically using technology like Delighted, you can actually control your clients' feelings about you in a positive way, right, by positive feedback, and build them into the type of clients that will refer you and will drive business and will come back to you over and over again. 